going to go ahead and get started. I'm Deanna Jonovich, Assistant City Manager with the City of Phoenix. Welcome everybody to tonight's budget hearing. We have a great turnout. This is our youth budget hearing that we hold once a year uh, specifically for youth, but of course everybody's welcome to come and speak at the budget hearings. This is a series of 20 because we added one, right? This is a series of 20 budget hearings where we go out to our community, ask for your input as a part of our budget process. We do have a number of city staff that are here. Can all of the city staff please stand up or raise your hand? Uh, so we have multiple city departments that are here represented today as well that are also listening in to all of your input and suggestions into our budget process. Uh, at the completion of the bu uh, community input, we take all of that information back, have a discussion with our mayor and council. Uh, your voice does matter. We do incorporate many times each year some of the suggestions and ideas that come out of the budget hearing. So again, thank you for being here tonight. The way it's set up is we're first going to show a short video. Um, if anybody is wishing to speak, if you make sure that you fill out a speaker's card, uh, we are allowing each person three minutes to speak, and Jeff will be our timekeeper, so you'll hear the bell ding if your three minutes are up. At the completion of the video, uh, Councilwoman Pastor will be arriving shortly, and then we'll go right into the uh, public comment cards. A lot of the things that we're talking about in the budget uh, this year and adds to the budget are things that we've heard at previous budget hearings like homelessness, library hours, arts. There's a multitude of things that um, we really have the opportunity to incorporate into the budget. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and show a short video. The councilwoman will be here and then we'll start the public comment process. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20, proposed by the City Manager for public review and comment. The City budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the City prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services and $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. 
The primary focus of the General Fund Service Editions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Joe Max Road in North Phoenix. Add funding for seven sworn fire positions, creating a new ambulance rescue unit at Fire Station 58 to improve emergency response times in Southwest Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department, de-escalation training and community response services support for officer-involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's Traumatic Incident Intervention Resources Ad Hoc Committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident-Based Reporting System. And second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness. In human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups to clean up blight work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street Transportation and Public Works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right-of-way for a cost of $970,000. Historic Preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, Neighborhood Revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, Community Services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. 
Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. Strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. So thank you uh, again for coming in. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, my name is Jeff Barton. I'm the city's budget and research director. So we're waiting for the council member to come in now, but I do want to have the interpreter introduce herself to the group. Hello, my name is Sandra. Me llamo Sandra y soy la intérprete. So si ocupan audífonos, nomás me dejan saber. Thank you. So as once the council member comes in, we're going to have each of you come up here that want to speak. So we do have about 30 cards of those that do not want to speak. So what will happen with those cards, I will have those transcribed into the minutes. So your comments will be reflected in the minutes that, are, that actually go to the council each week, okay? So what I want to do now is just we're going to waste a couple of minutes until the council member gets here. So first and foremost, um, this budget, again, what we're trying to do, the trial budget that comes out is specifically put out there to elicit your feedback. It is not set in stone, it's not yet decided. And many of you can witness and attest to last year, based on your feedback, there were changes to the final budget. And that is a part of our process. So a lot of cities do not go through the extent of public outreach that we do. And again, can we do better? Yes, we can. Um, I think there's always opportunity for improvement. And we are actually working on that. So next year, early in the process, we actually are going to be rolling out an online tool that allows you as residents and as citizens to actually come in and play with the budget and get me and my other department heads information about what you see as a priority. Some of that information we've actually already showed with some of your group. We met with Viri, we met with Paris, and we met with Michael Ingram of Podair, and we actually walked them through what this, what this tool looks like. And I think they were fairly, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they were excited about the tool and the timing and the rollout about what we're going to be doing. But again, so what, what happens here, our last budget hearing is, is on Thursday, April 18th, okay? So come, coming from April 18th, May 7th, we'll, we'll be, we'll be we'll, uh, I'm getting tongue-tied. On May 7th, we will actually bring back the budget to the council, and that budget will reflect the feedback to the extent that we can actually afford and make some changes. So that's called the city manager's uh, recommended or proposed budget. And then on May 22nd, so two weeks after that, the council will have their first opportunity to actually vote on the budget. And then following that, we have to go through a legal adoption process. That happens on June 5th and June 19th. And so then that we actually have an adopted budget at that point. And then because it's so fun, we get to start this whole process all over again next year. Um, but again, it is important that you're here. We take your feedback very seriously. 
and the council member just walked in. So as soon as she gets up here, um, we will actually start the hearing. So give her a few minutes to get situated. Carlos Mendoza. Hello. Thank you. Hello there. So my name is Carlos Mendoza, and I'm with the Phoenix Teens Program. And I just want to say thank you so much for being able to hopefully increase the budget hopefully, because it would mean a lot to our Phoenix teens. It has been such a life-changing opportunity for many of our teens that we have. And not only that, but I may be recently new to the program itself, but I have witnessed a lot of the things that they do. They help at many of the community events that were hosted there, and not only that, but I've also gotten to witness that a lot of the Phoenix teens have had the ability to improve on their leadership abilities, and not only that, but contribute to their community as a whole. It really gives the teens a chance to, well, show how much they care about the community and make them feel like they can make an impact in part of where they're living and part of what they do. You can see it all around because not only do they make impacts in the community events themselves, but they also get the chance and are presented with opportunities to either organize different events, organize activities. For example, two of our community, er, community Phoenix Teens members were able to plan a field trip to Flagstaff, which isn't something that most people can say. And this is very valuable experience, which would help so many teens in progressing towards the future for school-wise, whether it's college or university, because many of these experiences are something that a lot of teens don't lack. And if we're able to give this to teens in a community that's so already, well, small and ignored most of the time, you can give them the chance to stand out and overshine and come out on top of the competition. Thank you. Are you done? Yep. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's good seeing you again. Catherine Russell. And then after that, it's Kennedy Peters. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Catherine. This is Shailene. Okay. Um, we're also in the Phoenix Teens. The Phoenix Teens, um, we were just going to add on to what Carlos said and say how it um, helped us grow a lot and we'd want to see it more, well, more people in the community have the opportunity to be in the program so they could, um, so they could um, experience what we experienced and how it showed us how to be a leader and, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I don't think I need this. Um, um, we you <laughs> okay. um, so we do different things like in the community. Um, a, recent, the a recent event that we had was the Teen Summit and it was an opportunity for teens to come out all through Phoenix and meet um, individuals who like made it in life or whatnot. And it was really fun and we got to learn a lot of new things and I would love to see it again and more often because we don't see it as often as we should and it would be very helpful to teens in phoenix because not a lot of teens get this opportunity and so yeah if you would increase the budget we would see it a lot more <laughs> so yes good to work thank you okay. kennedy peters Hi, 
Hi, Kennedy. You want to come over here and stand with me? And I'll just, I'll help you. Say your name. Come on, Kennedy. Oh, okay. I will Kennedy. tell you what she was like. <laughs> more, more, pro more programming? No, she would like the parks. To, to be, be open? Welcoming. Okay. She would like the Let me see. bathrooms to be unlocked. She would like the lights to be on. And she would like the gates to be open. Which park? All parks? Which park? All parks. Okay. Primarily Falcon Park that she walks to. Okay? That's perfect. Right. Thank you, Kennedy. Look at your community. Congratulations. <laughs> Melanie Aguilar and Fatima Hay. She has to be what? Paris six, seven? I'm sorry? How old is she? Uh, she is eight. Eight. Okay. That's, that would, my Sophia is 10, and I don't even think she would have even done that. So, <laughs> uh, Melanie Aguilar? Aguilar? No? Here? Gone? Fatima? I think I'm saying it right. I hope I am. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Salomon? And it just has Salomon. Okay. Oh. Okay, thank you. I didn't see you. Yes. Uh, my name's Solomon, and I think that we should invest inside a more sensitive better and more sensitive training to any type of service because um, people are often um, shut down or disrespected because of what happened to them. Like, let's say, for example, sexual and domestic violence. It's a very trauma traumatizing event <clears throat> that can destroy someone's mental ability so if we had a more suitable and stable uh, service, we could actually help those people feel like they're a part of everyone else. But also, we should also address the fact that what happened to them isn't, it's not like it's not important. It's very important because that's would make more and more people feel like they are actually um, people are actually standing together with them. And also, we should inv invest for free programs in youth because uh, some programs, they can cost up to 200 or even more, which obviously most, most people don't actually have that type of money. So if we had free programs for the youth, they could actually, um, it would mean more involvement inside everything. That's all I got. Thank you. Well, thank you. Maricela, Maricela Sofia Martinez Medina. She's not here. Anybody moving? Manuel. I think it's Angulo. Yeah. Okay. I was looking at your view. And then after that is Jennifer Hernandez. And then Sarai Munoz Perez. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Manuel Angulo. I'm a senior, senior from Central High School, go Bob, Bobcats. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about the benefits of investing in people. Now, I very humbly take a AP macroeconomics class, and from that class, I've learned that when an economy shifts uh, their resources uh, towards uh, helping the community in the forms of uh, youth programs or emotional and men mental support systems, um, then that, that creates a community that's more capable and educated to then ultimately join the labor force. 
and when we have a more capable labor force, then that uh, puts a growth to our economy and reduces our unemployment. So basically, the point of uh, invest, investing is in people is that they would um, grow themselves and be prepared for um, school, high, uh, college, and life so they can uh, eventually return to the community. And, and given the fact that we do have a strong community, I mean, a strong economy, we can still have one that's stronger. Just because we've taken spe steps in the right direction does not mean that we can afford to stop moving forward. Gracias. Jennifer? I need Jennifer, and then after that, Sarai Munoz Perez is up next. Then after that, Jasmine Mesa. Um, good evening, public servant Laura Pastor. Um, I am here today to speak about how unbalanced the budget really is. When I first looked at the budget, I thought to myself, wow, maybe they're finally putting our tax dollars to real use. But instead, I saw more criminalization, more criminalization against homeless people, more criminalization against young people, and continued criminalization against our community. And I say that because their effed up policies around beautifying the park only means kicking out homeless people to other neighborhoods. Park rangers are being put in, putting play, are gonna be put in parks to criminalize us, young people. And you keep investing in police who are literally hurting us, killing us, beating us, and shooting us. This is our money, and I demand that you stop investing in criminalization and invest in free youth programs that will help us get a job pass our permits, teach us skills that we actually need that school doesn't get to teach, to invest in affordable housing, invest in mental health resources that will actually help us strive and be healthy. Sarai? Not sure where Sarai is. Is that you? Okay. And then the next person to come up is Jasmine. So I don't know where Jasmine is. Okay, uh, good evening, hi. Um, I'm a senior at North High School. Um, it's great to see all the youth here. It's really important that we talk um, because we're usually not given a voice to speak, uh, which is unfair because we're, we also have opinions and we're not dumb. Anyways, I have a few things that I wanna talk about tonight. I think we should be investing more in youth programs and people versus criminalization. Uh, the Phoenix PD already gets 69% of the budget, so I don't know how we could call that a balanced budget. Also, young people need to have their, their hobbies and their passions fueled. I cannot afford any art classes that I want to take outside of school. I could barely afford the ones that are in my school. Like, um, and I know that most of us don't have enough money to pay for these programs, and I, I think that like we're, I mean, most of us don't have jobs and even if we did, like a lot of us have to help like for our families. That's why young people have to get jobs when they're already dealing with school. So we need to invest more in that. We also need to invest more in like um, giving more money for like environmental like um, programs or like I guess, like as Phoenix is getting bigger, the air pollution is getting worse right now and as the fifth largest city in the US, we need to be setting an example for other cities to be more eco-friendly. Um, that's important, climate change is real. Even we're one city, but we can make a difference. And the fact that we're not investing enough money in that, we're only investing like 6% to all of that in the last year's budget is ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Um, I want to be. I want Phoenix to be something that we can be proud of. Um, so I'd like to see more of that. Also, uh, this is the fifth budget hearing I'm at, and most of them were really empty. I think that um, council should be like required to fill, or like they need to fill a quota. The seat, all the seats need to be filled. Um, our the program I'm with, we're the ones inviting people. Um, we, that's, we're, that's not our job. I mean, it's great that we're doing it, but that's not our job. 
So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Jasmine Mesa. After that is Isabel Garcia. And then after that is, I want to say, Jose Luis Castillo. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jasmine, and I'm a senior at North High School. Uh, I'm here today demanding a stronger investment in our youth. I think we should really be prioritizing um, youth programs. And because um, a lot of them are unaffordable to a lot of families, I know I, I've always wa I always wanted to like join art programs or any other types of programs, but my family could never afford it. Um, there were, so in addition to that, I think we should also be focused on actually cleaning up parks. I know in the proposed budget, there's a neighborhood cleanup, and that doesn't mean they're cleaning up like our parks from the trash or like making them nicer. That means kicking out homeless people from their encampments, from where they live. Um, I don't know how that in any way solves the problem. We need to be, um, sorry, <laughs> we need to be um, helping them, giving them resources, and finding them a place to stay if they don't have any other place to stay. Um, so, instead of investing more than like 69% of the budget in COPS, we should be investing in the communities, investing in youth so that they're not afraid, so that they um, feel safe. And another important thing that like Sarai brought up is that we, sh you guys should really make a bigger effort to fill up these seats. Um, like she said, we brought up, we brought like the majority of these people here. If we hadn't invited everyone out, then it would be a lot emptier. I've been, I've also been to the past like a couple past, sorry, budget hearings, and those were a lot less filled up. And I really think you guys should make the effort to do that. Um, and then transparency in the budget is also really important. We should be having like a quarterly report on where the money um, is going. I know there's been lots of times where you guys said like. Um, money was being invested in certain places, and we really haven't seen a lot of investment in our communities. Um, I hope you realize you should be investing in the people of Phoenix and not criminalizing them or making them afraid. Thank you. So, Hasmin, there's an online checkbook um, that you can look at everything that's being spent. I will give you the uh, website and also the area where you can see that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Isabel. I uh, was born and raised here in Phoenix. I'm here to stand in solidarity with all of the high school students and all of the young adults that are here today. Um, I want to reiterate what my uh, fellow Phoenix residents have been saying about uh, the city not investing in further criminalization of us, Phoenix residents, um, especially um, the security at parks and at library, at libraries that we know would criminalize youth who use parks and libraries. They're uh, one of the groups um, here in Phoenix that frequently use those services that the city offers. Um, so we want to be clear, we are demanding that that money that is set to be used for park rangers at parks um, and for library at, um, for security at libraries to be used for the services and the programs that high school students, that youth, that young adults would actually benefit from. Um, there, and we know that the city offers a lot of uh, programs already, but these programs are inaccessible. Uh, they're too expensive. Um, so we are demanding that this money that's being used uh, the nearly $2 million that's being used for further criminalization in our libraries and parks be used for free or low cost, very low cost and accessible programs. Um, also, I want to reiterate uh, what uh, was mentioned around the neighborhood cleanup um, that is being um, actually going to be used to destroy um, encampments for, ho um, for folks who don't have homes. Uh, we have um, an affordable housing crisis here in Phoenix. Uh, not enough is being invested in housing uh, here. So instead of uh, further criminalizing folks who don't have homes, uh, why not invest that money in, in actual solutions that are going to solve um, this problem? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Jose Luis Castillo. 
And then I believe it's Ileana. It says Ileana P. And then Elvira Vaquera. No? Okay. Elizabeth CR? No? Okay. I want to say America, but I'm not sure. I want to say America Medina. Okay. Manibel Lopez? Hi, my name is Maribel Lopez and I attend um, Phoenix College. I come on behalf of my community to demand more funds for our people. The city of Phoenix already has the deadliest police department in the country. Giving them another 2.5 million of the general funds is not gonna fix anything. It would only make things worse. The city of Phoenix needs to stop over criminalizing our people. Crime rates aren't going up. More things are being criminalized. Like people can't even take their um, people's voting ballots to the polls because that's a crime. We need to stop over criminalizing our people. We need to invest more in our communities. We need to invest in um, youth programs. We need to invest in homeless services. We need to invest in mental health support. We need to help our people instead of criminalizing them. You're giving 69% of the budget to the police, but only 14% for community development. And this is not acceptable. We can really see where this we can really see where the city's priorities are. And we can tell that we are not one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Daisy, Daisy Carreras. Daisy, is she here? Is there a Daisy? Oh, there she is. And I know I messed up your last name. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Daisy Casares. I am a student at North High School, and I will be discussing the distribution of the city budget money. Um, I personally believe that the budget money is distributed in a way that doesn't benefit our community. The police get around 16% of the budget compared to other categories like tra transportation, who only get 1%. When I used to take the bus home and from to school, it would rub it or it would arrive at it. It would take a ridiculous amount of time to arrive, and then if it, there wasn't enough room, we'd have to wait even more. Transportation is something that many people, especially students like myself, value. Transportation is also something that is around and needed constantly by everyone, even, even more so than the police. The police of Phoenix have criminalized the people of our community, and even more lately, so I see no reason for how much, for how much they are receiving of the budget. Are the police going to take me to school? Are the police going to take me home? I strongly believe that we, be that we need a change in the budget and that will actually benefit the city of Phoenix. We need money to be put towards the people of their community rather than against them. Thank you. So I'm looking for Stephanie Via Conchos. I can't, Via Lobos. Okay, because I was like, I, I know Via Lobos, but I was like, I don't know if this is an L, what this is. I got Via. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. It's just me, I can't read right now. So my name is Stephanie Villalobos and I'm a high school student at Maryville High and I'm a freshman. And I'm here to demand more youth programs because I'm like, I'm like a cheer, I'm a cheerleader and if you guys like, like other high school students, you know that the seasons are like, they have different seasons and different like months and I also play softball. So when my cheer season is over, I don't feel like there's anything else taking up my time. And I don't like, I'm like personally, I'm like the type of person that I go home and I just don't know what to do because I like to keep myself busy. So there's like this certain time limit, like it's like this time process that softball season comes in. And I, I just really don't know what to do. And when we go, when it's like school's over and that bell rings, where do I go? Like, we have, well, at Maryville, we have nothing, like, nothing around. We have a CVS, a liquor store, RJ's, and we have the golf course. 
So my question, if I could say a question, is where would you suggest for me to go out of all those three places that I just mentioned? So like, I just really like believe that. But every time, I have a personal story here too. So when I would go to CVS, they would question me for everything I went, like, went in. And they would be like, do you have an adult? Where, can I see your ID? And I just feel like that really wasn't like acceptable. And I felt really like uncomfortable as like a student too, that I couldn't go in there and just buy my stuff that I wanted to get. And also that also happened again at RJ's. So I just feel like we should have like more youth programs. So that's really all I wanted to say. Jessica Briston. Jessica. Um, so I also had a question uh, for the people sitting right here. On your guys' website, you guys use the word uh, sustainable, and I just wanted to know what you guys meant by that. So sustainable from a budgetary standpoint means that the money, the funds that you have available can be spent ongoing for services rather than being a one-time funding source that can only be spent one time. So it's funds that are available to perpetuate something in perpetuity. So what I see right here is that your guys' definition of sustainability for the Phoenix communities is to uh, fund our police force with two point five million dollars to continue the sustainability of criminalization in our cities, uh, which is not okay. I'm gonna say it again, we should not be funding the police force and that at the deadliest police force. Also, this idea of putting park rangers um, is just another form of criminalization for our communities. Our parks need upgrading. Our parks need more shade infrastructure. It's hot outside and it's only gonna be getting hotter. We need more green space, native green space in our parks and our communities. Um, furthermore, I do wanna touch base on um, the, our physical natural environment and our earth. I don't see any uh, money being funded towards that besides like landscaping. Um, and so I do think we do need to invest in more um, flood management. I don't know if you guys noticed, but when it rains here, the streets are flooding, uh, the sidewalks flood. And so um, it would be really important to invest into that, not only because it would uh, decrease the erosion of our infrastructure, but as well um, recharging our aquifers that are underneath us because water is life and we can't live without water. And we're in a drought right now. Um, so every drop of water that falls into our city, we should be collecting. And I'm just gonna say this one more time. This budget includes a clear attack on homeless communities in Phoenix, including what is masked as uh, neighborhood cleanups. And so you guys are going into these places where homeless people are sleeping and living, um, and you guys are labeling that as uh, neighborhood cleanups, which is outrageous. Uh, we should be actually looking for real solutions for our, the homeless population in Phoenix. I'm gonna use all my three minutes because I got them. Um, and so this card says, Phoenix police are the deadliest police force in the country. The additional 2.5 million from the general fund um, taxpayer money is unacceptable. While there are neighborhoods in our communities that don't have the most basic necessities, we demand a freeze on any uh, new tax money from the police until our communities are equitably funded. Thank you. Jonathan Gutierrez and then Carol Poor. Hello everyone, so my name is Jonathan Gutierrez and I'd like to start off by talking about how thankful I am to be up here giving the, getting the chance to speak about certain things in my community. I'm a senior at 
not just Trevor Brown High School, but also Metro Tech High School. And I'd like to bring that up first of all, because going to these two schools, I see a big difference. I see that there are more opportunities at Metro Tech with different programs of skills that I've learned and I have found useful. And if I didn't come here, and if I just would have only been going to Trevor Brown, I know that I wouldn't have gained those skills. skills. And I've, that's why I think it is necessary to um, use more of the funding on youth programs so that there are more, so that we can have more programs that help our youth so that we can be more successful in life. I'd also like to bring up, like talk about the funding in general, like, it was. It said that it's distributed evenly and it's fairly, but I don't believe that it's fair. There's because police and is put up so high, we are seeing a a like a lack of many resources that we find nest like as a necessity. My where I live in, it's not as pretty as it is as it is in the east side. And if that, the funding was distributed more evenly, we would be able to live in a community where things are more, you don't see much of a different gap. But it's, and they still want to make that gap bigger by putting in more money for the police rather than distributing it to other places that is needed. I'd like to also finish, finish up by bringing up the municipal ID. I feel that the municipal ID is a really good good thing because it gives people who don't have many opportunities because they don't have the ID necessary to to buy homes or other things. It would help with investing in affordable housing. You would see a big change because and it won't won't be so hard. Criminalizing can go down. And like I brought up before, criminalizing goes up. So is going is supposedly going up, but um, that's because new uh, new policies and laws are being made up. Like I just recently learned, and I didn't even think I don't even think this would have been a logical thing. I wouldn't have imagined it being a thing until I heard about it. I heard that undocumented people aren't allowed to collect register um, vote registrations just because they're not documented. Why? Are, are they afraid that these people of speaking up for what they believe in? Everyone should be able to speak up for believing, and that is why I'm up here today. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Poor and Ellen Bilbury. Councilwoman Pastor and audience tonight. My name is Carol Poor. I'm a native Phoenician and I actually went to this high school when it was West High uh, and very proud of what's going on at Metro Tech. And first of all, I just want to say it touches my heart that the youth are here tonight speaking up for causes that are important. Your voice is so powerful. And I think it's important to say that you guys are leaders today and you're leaders of our future. So thank you for being here. And the reason I'm here tonight is it's related, it's a quality of life topic, and it's about public art. And I first want to thank you, thank the council, and thank staff and people that have supported the maintenance funding of our city's public art. Um, it it uh, was approved for about 100,000 last year. And just to give you the scope of it, public art is seen not only on our freeways and in parks, and in the shade structures at bus stops. Uh, public art is all over the city outdoors, and we have about 200 various pieces of public art in the city of Phoenix in outdoor places in all of the different Phoenix districts. But also, we have about 2,000 pieces of indoor public art. We call them portable art because we can carry them or we can take them off of walls. And th these uh, public art pieces are in our libraries, they're at City Hall, and they're at a very special small gallery called the Gallery at City Hall, right at the ground floor of City Hall in downtown Phoenix. And guess who owns all of this public art? Guess who owns it? You do. We do. It's public art. It belongs to the city, which means it belongs to the people that live in the city. So 
my my uh, advocacy today is first of all to thank you for your your current support of public art maintenance and I want to encourage you to continue that level and because we we're having a good year to maybe give a little more maybe 20 25 percent more and when you think about it, when you have public art like Her Secret is Patience at Civic Space Park in downtown, it's a beautiful net that lights up. How many people have seen that? It's downtown, it's really pretty at night, and it's pretty during the day. That net has to be changed about every five years when the sun damages it. Some of our bridges and, and overpasses that are artistic, they need to be repainted every once in a while. Sometimes our public art gets damaged by people that do um, graffiti and, and, and damage our outdoor public art. All of those things need repair because if we let them sit there in disrepair, that does not create ci civic pride and it doesn't beautify our neighborhoods. So public art maintenance, it's like having a car and changing your tire or changing the oil. If you have a car or a bicycle or anything that's nice and you don't keep it up, then you let it go into disrepair. And so I think that's an easy way to understand public art. We have beautiful public art in our city. Our city has some of the best public art in the world. And it's important to keep it up, to maintain it. And I should have said, I'm the chair of Friends of Phoenix Public Art. It is not the city, it's a 501c3 nonprofit, and we always are out there raising money to supplement what the city has. So we're trying to raise money to help the city as well on the private side. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Bilbray? Did she leave? Did she hear? Alan? I think she left. Okay. Uh, Gisela Hernandez. Okay. I don't think she's. I just got these right now. Okay. Noah Simmons. Wait, no, oh, is it? Okay. This. I thought she went up because we had the same name. <laughs> Oh, I have to hold it with my hand. I'm not a hand-eye coordination type person. Um, just got to be honest about that. Okay, hi, my name is Isabel Hernandez. I am with Reframe Phoenix. We are a youth art center based out of the South Side. Uh, I am here tonight because I was invited by Poder. Uh, just here to support them. We love them dearly. Um, something I want to bring up and something that's been heavy on my mind is the way that society is circular. And the way that I often think about this is that the fact that there's a lack of funding for our youth and the fact that it's going to our police department is that that funding goes directly into criminalizing our youth, into criminalizing people, marginalized people from a young age, and thus putting them into the cycle of being in juvie or going into our prison system, which then creates the cycle for them to do that generationally. And it's hard for us as marginalized peoples to break away from. And that's what really breaks my heart is that this money is going into just another cyclical madness that my family can't even seem to break away from. The fact that a lot of people in my family are in prison and that if they had funding when they were kids to be able to do arts programs or sports programs and to be able to break away from that, they would have been able to not gone to prison, not having to resort to dealing drugs on the streets to support their families or their children that they had when they were in high school because they didn't have the right power or knowledge to know right from wrong yet. Because they were taught from a young age that they were criminals, that they were somebody to just kick to the side. And so when I send my cousin letters, I tell him that I'm proud of him for pursuing his education so that when he gets out, he can tell his daughter, who is brown and beautiful, that she is deserving. I just think that in order to break away from this cycle, we have to focus on what's important. It is about mobilizing our youth. It is about mobilizing black and brown bodies within our communities. It is about mobilizing LGBTQ people in ways that we haven't yet, in ways that we are working towards. Um, I don't know. I feel like I've been talking a lot today. I'm a little winded. Okay. I'm just going to say thank you to everybody for coming tonight. I think it's so lovely. I feel all these like really powerful energies from all these people. 
And it's, it's good. It's heavy, but it's good. I just have to say that. And I appreciate y'all for coming out. That's it. Noah Simmons. Oh. Hi, guys. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Noah Simmons, as you heard. Um, I'm with ACES TV, the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. I am part of the Young Advocates Institute Southwest. Uh, we have to say Southwest because there's another one in North Carolina and we can't copy their name. But. <laughs> So today I wanted to talk about uh, youth arts programs, uh, kind of how you did. Uh, so I wanted to talk, I'm an actor. I'm a freshman at Arizona School for the Arts, and I am an actor. Uh, I love it. It is what I want to pursue as my career. And I don't know if I would have ever had the opportunity to have this experience to find my career path without my school. And let me tell you something, my school is very small and my school is very hard to get into. Um, there is a, not a lot of spots to get into and we need more um, programs and we need more organizations that will allow kids like me who want to pursue acting or want to pursue, pursue any other forms of art. And art ranges from, from the art as in painting and drawing to art as in dance. And you can even consider some sports arts. Art is a very, very, very broad term, and it can be interpreted in many different ways. And if we were able to create these organizations using this budget money, we can get so many kids to, to realize who they really are inside and really, really get to be able to find their own personality and make themselves a unique person. And in order to make a unique person, you need to have an, an welcoming and an opening society. And a group of unique people will make this society even better. It will make a beautiful society. And if we were able to create this beautiful society in Phoenix, we wouldn't have these problems. We would be able to use our budget money for certain things. We would be able to use our budget money for things that really matter in our world. And in order to, and so having these arts implement organizations would just, which it would just improve all kids' lives and they wouldn't have to result to, as you said, drugs to deal with their families or to take care of their kids they had in high school because they didn't have this education and weren't grown up right. And so that's what we need. Thank you. I'm gonna say this wrong. Uh, I'm just going to say the last name, Bragg. <laughs> I, I can attempt it. <laughs> Endy. Endemia. Yeah. See, I was asking. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It's all right. I knew, I knew that you were talking about me. Mr. Bragg. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. My name is Endemian, representing <laughs> Fulfillment and Training. And can you guys hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, my name is Endymion Bragg, and I represent a group called Fulfillment and Training. And what we do is um, we're a fitness organization uh, focused on bringing the inner city youth as well as Phoenix PD together uh, on the common ground. Uh, and that is using just fitness to bridge the gap between Phoenix PD and the youth. And also what we do is organize uh, particular programs like city beautifications um, to go out and clean up uh, neighborhoods and and uh, just uh, just the surrounding cities. Uh, also, we had a particular group go out and do the feed my starving children. So, I just came up here to say, invest in an organization that invests in the community. Stephen Baines. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. Hello, my name is Stephen, and yeah, <laughs> and I'm with Fulfillment and Training as well. And what we I understand the frustration and having the separation between police and community, but the whole point is to be a holistic community functioning with the police. 
Um, if we think about like to have a healthy community, think about having officers working with the kids, doing homework and being mentors, playing basketball and actually functioning as a true community. So not only, so I have my gift as being an athlete, so I knew that was one of the things that I could bring to the community. And I've been in social work working from um, youth and with homeless for over the last 12 years, from administration to front lines. So using those skills, I was able to network and find the opportunity to bring in city officials, police officers, judges, and they literally are working out with people in the community, working together, finding ways to make the community better. We do community cleanups. We go out and address the homeless and provide them with services right then with the officers, with probation. We went to the park, literally cleaned up alleys to make the community uh, more safe and more attractive for the people that live there. So it's easier for the kids to go play at the parks. So the whole point is making sure that not only having programs, but having programs that are holistically connecting the community. And so one of our acts is for fittest for funding so that right now we're just out of South Mountain High School. So we can only do so much working with South Mountain High School. Having our own facility, I've been working with um, the county to work on diversion programs. So kids with felons that don't need felonies, we can work and uh, address those through a diversion program to help uh, those that should have it drop to a misdemeanor. Or addressing other avenues of uh, education, healthcare. We've worked with DES and South Mountain Park Medical to create a direct connection for individuals that need medical assistance and things like that. So our biggest thing is to let that let people in the community know that that's something that is available. We're called fulfillment and training. Um, our website is fitwins.org. We're out of South Mountain High School, and by having a facility and funding, we can make it a larger organization, and we can touch more people and start to truly bring in the sense of having a holistic, healthy community between community and police. Because we don't want a unpoliced community. We need the community, the police working with the community. As we continue to grow, we're going to have people that don't know our communities, people that don't know us. So until they come and learn to acclimate into our community, we need to make sure that they understand, but at the same time working with PD and our other first responders to make our communities more safe. That's it. Adriana Gonzalez. Uh, hi, y'all. My name is Adriana Gonzalez. Um, I'm standing here today as an 18 year old student of life. Um, and I wasn't going to speak, but I actually heard a statistic, a percentage um, that kind of was very shocking. Um, just hearing that the Police now consume 69% of the general fund in the budget. That's ridiculous. Um, just last year in the 2018 to 2019 budget, it was, or the year before that, sorry, it was uh, just 54%. So that's a 15% increase, and I believe that's uh, outrageous. Um, and it's also, I just want to like also come as um, kind of not an example, but like my family really feels a lot of that, you know, 69% of funding because um, it seems that. I, or my family is like the perfect star child of, like it's an example of being heavily criminalized. So today I heard that my brother's going back in jail um, because he violated his probation and that's because he couldn't pay his fines uh, for his uh, anger management classes or whatever. So yeah, that 69% um, really shows, you know, uh, it attacks people who need mental health resources. Um, or need mental health support, I should say. Um, my father, who is also in jail, who was uh, put into jail the uh, February of this year, um, it was also on terms of violation of probation, but that's because he couldn't get access to his doctor at Taros, who is also publicly funded. Um, and dealing with my mother right now, who has mental health uh, issues as well, um, yeah, she cannot get through to Taros, and it's easily visible that, um, Phoenix values criminalization over uh, investment. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight that fact and just amplify the 15% increase, uh, 15, one, five, 10 plus five percent increase in, uh, in police funding. Um, yeah, so. Anyone else have a card? Okay, well the budget hearing is over.
I uh, would like to thank uh, the youth for participating. Uh, normally, uh, this started, I want to say, three years ago, maybe longer. Longer? I just, <laughs> yeah, probably maybe six. Okay, well, I think what happened is that uh, former Councilman uh, Valenzuela and I decided that we were going to have a youth uh, budget hearing. Uh, there was a lot of adv advocacy for it, and so we started it. Uh, I am very sad uh, to see that none of my other colleagues uh, joined me, because normally they do. And so I really appreciate that you're here. I really appreciate that you're participating in the process. Um, I would say continue to participate in the process. Uh, one of the things that I've learned as a young child, change is slow. Uh, but if you keep at it, it keeps moving and things happen. And so really appreciate you being here. Thank you. And good night. Get home safe. <laughs>